church is, it's like this living moment. And I only find out that it's truly alive uh, when I mess up. <laughs> and then you're like, oh, this one is unique uh, compared to the fantasy of the one I have in my head. Like, <laughs> and actually, I think that's really important, right? What is happening right now is alive. What we're experiencing right now is this thing that is not, um, it's not formulaic. You know, we try, to, we try to sort of set it up so that we know sort of where we're going. But it's a journey every single time. And just like every other journey you've taken, it is different than the one that you thought you were taking. And that's the way the service is. It's always funny. Um, so I'm going to start t telling a little story about the lay ministers, and uh, which is Isabel was so courageous to be our very first one today. And <laughs> and the what I one of the things that well actually I don't even know if I've told you guys this yet, but we think about how to do it perfectly. And I used to get so upset when, like, my first year of ministry, I'd be like, oh, my God, I messed it all up. And it, it took me a full year to be like, oh, yeah, there's never a service that goes the way I planned it. It's n there isn't one. Because it's alive. And what, we're, what we do together is not try to be perfect, but to be alive. So... So I'm going to tell you a little story about how the lay ministers came into my life and now, and now how they're coming into your life. And I didn't know it at the time, but the seed was planted with a short conversation following, the serv following a service that, at my very first congregation with this woman named Mary Traverson. And Mary stood about five feet tall uh, in her boots, and she had these, the the most shockingly blue eyes that you've ever seen. And she kept her hair really short and spiked up. And she was kind of hard to understand because her, the, she had Parkinson's and it had progressed quite strongly. But she was there every week, sort of third row from the back on the preacher's right-hand side. And she must have gone through five or six pastors. You know, it's always that humbling thing. She's three girls in the church, and she had this irrepressible enthusiasm that just refused to yield to the disease. And I adored her. And one Sunday, I had preached about Martin Luther King, and, and she came up to tell me afterwards how she'd, gotten, she'd been to see him on the mall in 1963. And words were really costly, so she kept right to the details uh, because it was not an easy journey getting to the mall. She first got the idea uh, while riding in the car with her husband, and she said that she wanted to bring their daughters to see Dr. King, and, and he got quiet, and then he got stern, and he said, you're not going to ruin my good name. And Mary looked at her husband, and then she rolled down the passenger side window, and she took off her wedding ring and she threw it out. <laughs> and my jaw was like... <laughs> and I knew that she wouldn't want to tell that story in front of the congregation because of uh, the Parkinson's. So I asked her if I could share it and she, she agreed. And a couple weeks later I recounted the story and there was much applause and excitement. It's our little Mary, huzzah! Right? <laughs> And after the service, she came up to me laughing. She's like, that was so stupid, I paid for half that ring. <laughs> <laughs> you know? but, but I like to believe that the inheritance that she left her daughter was far greater than any material, right? And, or even bringing her daughters to the mall to see Dr. King speak. I imagine that what she taught them was really about courage from her own experience. That was her inheritance. 
And, and shortly after I shared Mary's story, another member of the congregation, Eva Ludwig, uh, had me over for tea, and she took out the, the yellow stars that she was forced to wear when she was younger because she was born in Berlin and her father was Jewish. And she was just barely a nurse uh, when World War II broke out, she's still in her teens, actually, she's 19. But because of the professional degree, uh, which was necessary during wartime, uh, this kept her from being immediately sent to the camps like other members of her family, and they, they put her to work in a hospital. And I don't know if you've, you've ever held one of those stars in your hands, but it's not what I expected. You know, I, I guess I sort of imagined it to be a patch, like something embroidered like the Cub Scouts. That's just sort of how it seemed in my head, but they're not like that. They're soft and they're thin and they're shoddy. And Eva told me how they came delivered in sheets and you had to cut them out yourself. And, and you know, it makes sense. Why would the Nazis put any effort into creating a quality product for people they hated? But then, as if to add insult to injury, people were expected to cut out the stars and then hem them to keep them from just fraying and falling apart because they only gave you one in the beginning and you had to transfer it from from outfit to outfit, and Eva asked me to flip it over and examine her mom's stitching, which was meticulous and precise. And the photographs I'd seen started to feel like illusions because they only showed one side of the star, that inhumane Nazi yellow. And the annoyance of being given one was still visible on Eva's face as she told me how she had to creatively adjust her wardrobe to comply with the law. But I couldn't stop staring at the stitching on the back. It was, it was a level of craft that you rarely see anymore. Right? Almost 70 years had passed at this time and not a single thread had, had unraveled. Shown yellow side out, it was a social symbol of, that was used to shame and dehumanize people. But flipped over, it was a story, in my interpretation anyway, of resistance, right? Of a people who, regardless of oppression, continued to put quality and care into every action, including hemming these horrible badges. To be clear, Eva was not proud of the star. When she went out, she wore a purse that was slung over her shoulder and pressed against her chest to kind of make it vanish, to deny its presence. Right? To the very end, people wearing those badges were disappearing off of the streets for no reason, without warning, with no closure. And so I, I, I want to make sure that that story is never forgotten, but you know, since holding one of those, I also always want to remember the stitching on the back, which could have just been so casually done, but it was not. In it, I see the strength of people who were still determined and still demanded of themselves quality and high standards, even when the whole culture had turned against them. Not long after that tea, Eva passed, and then Mary uh, followed her maybe a year or so later, and with them went those stories, right? perhaps shared only with family members now. But that congregation had a number of these amazing women. You know, in some settings, we call them crones, although I think crones make some people nervous. Wise women make people nervous. Why is that? Yeah. So I started to ask them to preach with me. And the first iteration of the lay ministry was actually called Voices of Sophia. Sophia is often translated as wisdom. And it's associated with the wisdom books of the Bible. Proverbs, Job, Song of Songs, Ecclesiastes, some of the Psalms. But Sophia is actually the name of the feminine co-creator of the cosmos with God. But you knew that because that's what they, they told you about that in Sunday school. 
the feminine co-creator of the cosmos with God. Yeah, it's not that funny of a joke. And it's not that funny because mostly her story has been erased over time. As it is right now, we can really only find her in Proverbs. But historically, there were a number of Gnostic, uh, Sophia sects, and, and occasionally they still bubble up from time to time. The divine feminine cannot be destroyed, even though we've put so much effort into worshiping patriarchy. Suppressed, sure, but you cannot destroy God. She, wisdom, is woven into the fabric of being. So after a year working with these crones, I decided to invite some older men to some of us have some wisdom, those of us in touch with the divine feminine anyway. And then I invited some younger people, and at some point I just changed the name to lay ministry because it, it just felt it had shifted, and it's become a defining feature of what I do. Everywhere I've served, I've worked with congregants to lift up stories of courage and transformation, of loss and heartbreak, of play, and well, even sex. Yeah. The sex ones are great. Nobody ever forgets those. <laughs> For centuries, uh, Christian churches have taught people what was important through stained glass stories that adorn their windows. You know, theatrically, they're animated by a light source in the sky, which fulfills a certain theological perspective as well. Before people could read and before they were even allowed to read the Bible for themselves, these illuminated stories were the scripture of the people. But our theology, as Unitarian Universalists, our theology invites us to see meaning and purpose in relationships, not, not just text, and, it, and to recognize the moment when we have agency. So I've often kind of fantasized about stained glass windows with Mary Traverson throwing her window, her ring out the window, and Eva Ludwig and, and her mother hemming stars with pride and resistance and anger at injustice. And I've always wanted our children to kind of look up at stained glass windows telling the stories of people from our pews who are not famous for doing something great, but, but who are meaningful to us because when the moment arrived, they did something right. As Unitarian Universalists, we're not trying to say the correct words to, to get access to the realm of the chosen. I mean, not, a, not most of us anyway. Some, maybe. Glenn. <laughs> Glenn. But we, we don't depend on a particular scripture for teachings about people from the past. We're, we're trying to hear the scripture of the life that is being lived in this moment. And, and when it arrives, we remember stories of people like Mary Traverson, which gives us the courage to do something right. You, me, we are actually writing scripture together. We are the scripture of the congregation. And sometimes this is hard to grasp because in, I actually think we've misinterpreted what church is about. You know, two weeks ago I talked about how sometimes outsiders make jokes about Unitarian Universalists. And they, they, call, they say this is a social gathering of like-minded people that we're not really a church, that we're not that significant. And it wouldn't normally matter what other people say about our faith, except that sometimes we've internalized what they say about this. And this misinterpretation of our church happens because our teleology is fundamentally different from other churches, right? Teleology is a $5 seminary word. <laughs> and really all it means is there's a purpose to this. Our understanding of the purpose of all of this, of what we're doing, Right? It's just different. It's just different. So while we use the word church, we don't really gather to train ourselves along doctrinal lessons in order to get into heaven. Most of us, anyway. What we really are is a wisdom school. What we really are is a wisdom school. 
And one of the crises that we're facing in society today is that we have a glut of information, but a dearth, a dearth of wisdom. We don't even know where to go to grow wise anymore. And I, I don't mean where you can go to hear a lecture or where you can go to take a class so you can be smarter. All of that's fine. But where do you go to grow wise? In this never-ending news cycle and the pro proliferation of sticky and addictive social media, not only have we lost access to wisdom in this culture, or we're even being burdened with anti-wisdom, we often don't even know where to join those who have chosen the wisdom path. Where do you find the wisdom path? And I think this is the purpose of the Unitarian Universalist Church, where we are, when we are at our best, we are wisdom schools. When we are at our best, we are not just trying to be smart and clever, we are people who stand in the tradition of those who have gathered around fires and told stories because what we are trying to do is prepare the next generation to be better than we are. To be better than we are. Our culture is in danger of losing this. We are so busy. We don't listen to one another. It's really uncomfortable to be in dialogue these days. There's so much self-righteousness, so much projection, so much judgment. And when I think about Mary throwing her ring out the, the window or Eva's mom meticulously hemming the Nazi stars, I imagine them also speaking to their daughters about why these acts are important. We are responsible for the generation growing up around us. How are we preparing them? They have school, they have the internet, and they have us. We are one of their sources of wisdom, and it's important for us to cultivate our own wisdom so that we can guide the next generation, so they can be better than we are. You know, it took a lot of courage for Mary to throw her ring out the window. And there are other women in 1963 who did not throw their rings away. It took a lot to, of risk. And today, I can only imagine what Mary might say about that act, but I suspect it went something like, I don't know what's going to happen if I do this. I just know that it was right. And I think this is the key to becoming a community focused on being not just smart, but wise, being wise. Not many of us has such dramatic stories, but the story doesn't have to be dramatic to impart wisdom. Often the best stories are simple. They just invite us to see how to do the next right thing, the next right action, how to be in relationship, how to help the next generation build on what we have built so they can become wiser. So we're going to enter into a little ritual now. We've been given a card. If, if you don't have a card, please raise your hand. And we're going to play just a moment of music, and uh, like a minute or so, and we'll get you a card. And just write down some notes about a story that someone told you, some wisdom, that, that you were given that has been with you for your life, that's been important in your life. Just a few notes about a wisdom story. Okay, now here comes the hard part, sharing. Uh, find somebody maybe that you don't know that well. Don't go crazy. Um, but maybe turn to somebody that you don't, you, you know, but maybe you could learn a little about. And we're going to give you each two minutes to share your story, and I'll let you know when two minutes are up so that you can, sh you can change, uh, just so you, you don't run over. Um, so. I want to close this morning. I want to close this morning with an abbreviated of a story collected by Martin Buber. 
After many years of poverty, which had shaken his faith, which had never shaken his faith in God, Rabbi Isaac, son of Rabbi Yekel of Krakow, dreamed that someone told him to look for a treasure in Prague under the bridge which leads to the king's palace. And when the dream came for the third time, Rabbi Isaac prepared the journey and set out for Prague. But the bridge was guarded day and night, and he didn't dare dig. Nevertheless, he went to the bridge every morning and he kept walking until evening. And finally, uh, the captain of the guard who'd been watching him asked whether he was looking for something or waiting for somebody. And Rabbi Isaac told him about the dream and the captain laughed and said, look, I dreamt that a Jew named Isaac from Krakow had treasure buried under his stove. But did I travel to Krakow to dig it up? Of course not. Go home and don't worry about your dreams. And Rabbi Isaac stopped for a moment. And then he bowed. And he traveled home and he dug under his stove and found a treasure <laughs> that he used to build a synagogue. <laughs> and the point of the story, as far as I understand it, is that we are always looking far and wide we have fantasies about treasures that are buried somewhere else. All the while, there is so much treasure in our own home. In our own home. And I mean this next bit with all sincerity. It might sound like a ploy. <laughs> it is not. I mean this with all sincerity. You should sign up to teach RE. It's not, a, uh, it's not a ploy. We are a wisdom school. And what we are trying to do is raise the next generation to be wiser than we are. There are very few intergenerational communities left. And there's very little wisdom being passed on anymore. But we do that here. And so when you think about signing up for RE, it's not to fill a slot. It is to grow wisdom in our community and in the world. We don't come to church to follow doctrinal codes, to, to get us into a, a land of the chosen. Not most of us, just Glenn. <laughs> He's going anyway. We are here to help the next generation become wiser than we are. We are invested in spiritual evolution. In this cacophonous world, replete with all forms of information, let us choose the wisdom path and grow wise together. Amen.